Hey, what's cracking? How are you doing today? I hope this video finds you doing well. I hope everything is going your way. I hope today that you've chose to uh, concentrate on the positive things that are going on in your life and not the negative. Uh, because we all can get to thinking about the negative and boy, things don't go too well, do they? So if this is the first time you've ever watched one of my videos, thanks for clicking on it. My name is Ricky Dye. I went to prison when I was 15 years old. I was there for over 20 years. Uh, I can't do anything about what I did in the past, but I make these videos in hopes of reaching some young person or any person who's thinking about committing a crime and, or down on their life and how things are for them. Maybe they can look at my life and think, hey man, things could be a lot worse. Hopefully it'll stop people from doing something that could end them up in prison. Usually when you uh, go to prison or when, when things go wrong for you in your life, generally your whole life doesn't change in one moment unless you get mad and shoot somebody or something. Usually when things go wrong, it's a series of things going wrong. And that happened for a friend of mine. He ended up being found guilty of being a contract murderer in, in prison, even though he didn't do it, even though he didn't kill someone for a contract. And I'm going to explain how those things went really bad and how it went really bad for the young guy who got killed. So if you've been keeping up with my story, I tell my stories. If you haven't watched them all, I tell them like a series. I started at the beginning with what happened with me, and I've been working my way all the way through. Now I'm at a prison in Hinton. It's the first time they put Oklahoma prisoners in a, a private prison. And I have a friend show up there, and his name is Jeff. And Jeff, at the time I was in my early 20s, maybe mid-20s, and Jeff was a little older than me, in his early 30s maybe. And Jeff had come to prison when he was 17 or 18 years old, and he was doing a life sentence. He'd got into a fight with a guy at a bar, killed him, found guilty of murder, given a life sentence. And he always talked about getting his case reversed. He really believed he had it on appeal, and he really believed that someday he'd get out of prison. But he'd been locked up close to 15 years. And when he first came to prison, he was real young like I was, and he had a guy try to bully him, tried to rape him. And he stabbed the guy, nearly killed him, and he went to McAllister for that. So he went to McAllister when he was real young, like I did, and he spent about five years there. And now he's got out, and he's made it to this private prison. And he's hanging out with me. He's a good friend of mine. I'd known him over whenever I was at Lexington when I was younger, too. He tried to pull me up. So enter into this story a guy named Bone. Bone, B-O-N-E. Okay, that was his real name. It wasn't his nickname. And uh, Bone came to prison, to, to minimum security prison. But he didn't do much to go to jail. Uh, I'm not sure what it was. It wasn't a big deal. He didn't have a lot of time. I think he was doing about a five-year sentence. He was about to go home. He got a dirty UA at a minimum, and so they sent him to this private prison around all of us hard cases, the people who are doing a lot of time doing life sentences, even though he hadn't really done anything. He, his, I forget what his thing was. It might have been stealing a car or a burglary. It might have been checks. Maybe it was drunk driving. I don't remember. It was something small. He only had five years. He never should have been in a medium security prison, really. He went to a minimum security, got a dirty UA for smoking marijuana, ended up in medium. Now, one way or another, Jerry Bone ended up in lockup. And I need to explain something to you about Hinton so you can understand like you're there with me. Okay, when you walk in the day room, say you're right here with me and we step in the day room. When you look straight across that day room, that day room wall on that that wall is going to be lined with cells, okay? This left-hand wall is also going to be lined with cells. So the left side is all cells. All in front of you, the wall is cells. The wall immediately to your back, there's going to be an ice machine right there, and there's going to be a sink and a microwave. On the right-hand wall, there'll be a TV on the wall, and out in the middle of the day room, there'll be a bunch of chairs where you can sit and watch TV. You with me? There's a set of stairs there on the left-hand side to go to the top room. So you're standing in this big square room. In front of you is the cells on the wall. Left-hand cells on the wall. There's showers over here at the end of these cells. You can walk in there and shower. So you go up and around to this end, up and over to that side. Now, when you walk into the day room next to you, everything is flipped around. There's walls on the other side of the room, same as this one, straight ahead of you, on your back. Still, but everything's on this side now. On the right-hand side, the wall is covered with cells. And the left-hand side is where the TV's hanging. It's just flipped backwards. So those cells at the end over there, those on the back wall, if you're, if you're in lockup, the only difference in the day room is, okay, BA and BB are lockup. Jerry Bone is in lockup in BB. He's on that back wall upstairs in the corner at the very edge of the wall. So on the other side of that wall is a cell of someone that's in general population. So what they've done is, 
the mortar in between the bricks. They've took their time and they've took some little ice picks and they have chiseled it out so that they've got a little slit about that tall and about that wide between the bricks where they can fold something up, coffee, and smash a soup up real good and, and wrap it up in a piece of newspaper real long and slide it through there. You could slide money through there. You could slide some weed through there, joints, cigarettes. But it's just a real skinny hole because all it is is they've dug the mortar out between the walls, between the, between the bricks, between those cells, so they can slide stuff. So, Jerry Bones got the hookup. So anybody that needs something in lockup, there's a guy that gets out during meal time and passes out the trays. And then he picks them all up and then gets locked back in his cell. But when you need something from the yard, you got it. What we do is send it up to Jerry Bone. Write a little note. Tell him what you need. He'll slide it through that wall. That guy in that other cell will go pass it off to whoever you send it to. And they'll take care of what you need. Send it back. And they got to pay everybody in the little line, you know. The guys, you got to pay Jerry something because you're using his cell. You got to pay the guy next to him you're sliding it through because you're using his cell. Well, this UAB, this Aryan guy, he has a $100 bill on him. He wants some weed from out in the yard. He sends his $100 bill up there to Jerry. Jerry Bone. Tells, does his real name, Jerry Bone, and tells him, send it through there. Send this $100 bill out there and get me this, whatever. So he sends that, that $100 bill up to Jerry, and that, Jerry, that, that, that $100 bill went missing. I can't tell you the details on what happened with that $100 bill. I'm not sure. All I know is that when they got back out on the yard, Jerry had some pressure on him from the guys. That, you know, obviously he was responsible for that $100 that didn't get where it was sent because he accepted it and charged to do it. And the $100 never got there. So he calls his mom, tells her, I'm fixing to come home. I can't afford to get in a jam with these guys, these Aryans. I need you to send them this money and pay them off. Now, she couldn't send the $100 all at once. But she made an agreement to send, I guess, $25 a week to this guy's mother or whoever to get that $100 back. So they're making payments on it. And now Bone's back out in the yard, and him and Jeff are running around together. And some dope come in, and they stayed up all night doing dope. And now it's early in the morning. Like, they cracked the doors around 6 or 6.30. I think this was around 7.45 or 8 in the morning. People were out eating breakfast. And to, from the time they let you out to, from 6.30 in the morning until around 8, 8.20, it's 8.20 at count time. 8.15 is count time. So from 6.30 to 8.15, the doors are open. You can go eat chow whenever you're ready. You don't go by units in the morning because a lot of people don't get up and eat, so there's no rush. At, at dinner, they do them unit by unit because there's so many people going to eat, they have to. But in the mornings, people just welcome to go eat as you're ready. Drop your laundry off at the laundry. Go by medical if you need to. Just be back at your cell by 8.15. So I'm over there sleeping in my cell, and all of a sudden banging on my door. I'm thinking nobody hits on my door when I'm asleep because in prison you never wake someone up because when they're asleep, they're not there. So the number one rule in prison, you don't wake someone up if they're sleeping. Bottom line, you wake somebody up, you're bringing them back to the penitentiary. You don't wake somebody up when they're asleep. So I'm really surprised someone's banging on my door and banging on it hard and I jump up and open the door and it's Jeff. He tells him, man, I think I killed this guy. Killed what guy? Oh man, I think I accidentally killed him. So what are you talking about? He said, come here. I walk over and he's looking. I said, look in the room. Bones laying in the floor. There's blood everywhere. He's, he's rolling around. His ears are so big. You can see that they are enlarged from, from through the cell window. And he's moaning. Oh, 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 rolling around the floor like he's trying to get up and can't. And I said, dude, he's, man, you better get him some help or he ain't going to make it. I said, man, what do I do, Rick? What do I do? I said, what, what the fuck happened, dude? And he said, uh, man, we were in the room. We've been up all night. He said, we, we, he's my partner, man. He said, we was waiting on someone to bring us a joint over here. And he was telling me how no one could get out of the sleeper if he put them in it. And, you know, I wrestled all through school. And I told him, I guarantee you, I can get out of it. So he put me in it. And I was showing him I could get out. No one was supposed to get mad. And he got mad and started swinging at me. And I didn't want to fight him. So I picked him up. I was just going to suplex him on the floor and hold him down, Rick. And when I suplexed him, his head hit the ground. And I didn't hit him or kick him or nothing, man. That's what happened. What am I going to do? I said, man, fuck, brother. I don't know. But if you don't give him some help, he's going to die. So Jeff goes over there and gets him and drags him out at the top of the stairs. where people can see him to help him. So I can't get involved in this, man. Because if that guy dies, that's a murder case. If I have anything to do with it, I can't help clean that shit up. I can't do nothing. 
Uh, I'm not even going to say I know what Jeff said because I'm not going to be a witness to that shit. And uh, I wouldn't talk about it now if it hadn't already been took care of because otherwise I'd be telling on him damn near. But he's already pled guilty. Oh, well, I'll get to it in the story. So these two guys in the day room see Jerry. And we tell him, hey, man, help him get down there. Help him get some help. So these two guys put one arm over each, pull him with one arm under each shoulder, and they walk him up, they're walking him up the hall, and the police sees him. There's just a blood trail behind him. And his head is swollen all up, man, and his ears are the size of the palm of your hand. They're that thick. I mean, they his ears are like, look like cartoon characters' ears. It was sickening. I had nightmares over that shit, seeing him the way he was. So the guards took him from them people, and they got him down to medical, and they called lockdown on the whole yard. And inside your cell, there's a button you can call in case of emergency. There's a speaker there. When you hit that button, a light comes on in the control room. Guards come over and push a button and ask you what you need. It's called a panic button. It's in case of someone having a heart attack or someone gets beat up real bad, whatever, you know, you could call for help. As soon as they locked the whole yard down, Jeff was feeling so bad. He had been on that dope all night. He went over there and he pushed the button and said, there's no need in locking everybody down. I did that. He had been in his cell. First, he cleaned all the blood and everything up, trying to get rid of it all. And then he decided there was no reason to lie about it. It was an accident. He was going to tell the truth. So he said, what'd you say? He said, I'm telling you that it was no need locking everybody down. It was, it was, I did that. It was an accident. I did it. So they come and got him and lock him up and take him away. And they said, Jerry Bone, he died on the way to the hospital. So now they come and they put crime tape up around the cell. We're all locked down in our cells. I stay a couple doors over. I look outside my cell, never see anything like it. There's crime tape like on TV around the cell. You can't go near it. And he had cleaned the blood up. They come in with these cameras and video where they could still see where the blood was at and where he wiped it and where the guy crawled across the floor. And they said that they knew he wasn't stomped because they seen there were certain moves weren't made. And so I guess Jeff had planned to just plead guilty to it and tell the truth to all of it. Enter the guy's mom. His mom started raising hell and said that this $100 bill got lost and I've been paying for it and they've threatened him for it and they had him killed. So that DA picked that up and they ran with it and they were going to charge Jeff for a contract murder in prison. And they were going to try to get them Aryans involved and bring other people into it. And they were going to try to give him a death penalty because he already had life in prison for murdering someone. So he made an agreement plead guilty to spending the rest of his life in prison and go to McAllister for a minimum of the next 10 years before he go before a board that's like a parole board to decide if you even get to go back to a medium security prison. He pled guilty to all that because he didn't want anyone else in trouble for what happened. He felt so bad about it. Just not one of those people I feel like belong in prison. That's two times that someone got killed. You don't know his own strength and he's good at wrestling and you never know when you're wrestling around with someone, you pick them up and slam them. You have no idea that their head's going to hit too hard and they're going to what happened is it cracked, he fractured his skull and his brain hemorrhaged. He bled on the inside of his skull and his brain hemorrhaged. Too much pressure in his brain killed him. Jeff didn't never even hit him, never even hit him once, didn't kick him once. He just picked him up and slammed him on the ground. He was going to hold him down. So you got to be careful, man. You got to be careful. You can't let your anger get the best of you. You got to just walk away until you can think it out. And if your life ain't going exactly the way you were thinking about money, objects, things, Comparing yourself to other people who have more. Don't do that, man. Compare yourself to people who have less because you're blessed in all kinds of ways if you just stop to think about it. And I hope you won't do anything that ends you up in prison. And I hope to see you in my next video. But before I go, shout out to the riders and the dyers who ride till the wheels fall off and the dyers who keep riding even when they do. Shout out to Jason, the new dyer. Thank you for the super thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Shout out to Todd Poole. You know why, bro. And I uh, hope to see you all in the next video. May God bless, keep, protect each and, each and every one of you. Peace out.